So we've been doing the long wind-up to Pentecost. If you haven't been counting the Omer as the Jews do, actually they stopped counting because today is Shavuot. And so they're done counting, but we start a week later. They start on the second day of Passover. We start on Easter Sunday. So next Sunday is Pentecost. And we've been talking about Pentecost. If you don't know what Pentecost is, it's the moment when the first followers of Jesus finally got infused with spirit. They, They finally broke through and understood their potential and the power of walking in spirit. And uh, the church celebrates that as Pentecost, the word that means 50. And so just as before Easter, we were counting through Lent, the 40 days of preparation for Lent. And 40 is that symbolic number that means a time of trial and testing or initiation into a rebirth, the rebirth of new life. And then we started another count right after Easter, which is counting to Pentecost, which is 49 plus 1. 49 understood as seven weeks of seven. Seven being another symbolic number that means spiritual perfection. Kind of cool. There are six earthly physical directions, right? Up and down, side to side, back to front. One more than that is spiritual perfection. And that's the way the Jews looked at these numbers. Seven times seven is spiritual perfection times spiritual perfection. Spiritual perfection squared. And then the one more day takes us to the 50th day, which is Pentecost. So we've been talking through this, not in terms of historic, you know, remembrances. But the idea is, is how do we prepare? How do we personally prepare for a breakthrough of spirit? And really, what is going on here? What is Pentecost? But a breakthrough of trust, a breakthrough of awareness of the action of spirit in our world, in our lives, and our connection to that spirit. The understanding that the spirit is within It empowers us. It emboldens us. When we are connected with spirit, we understand that everything is going to be okay, one way or another. And with that in our back pocket, so many more things become possible. Risks that were unthinkable before become thinkable, and we can move in new directions. So how, of course, do we prepare? How do we prepare? We've been talking about that as well over these last few weeks. We've been looking at the fears that stifle this spiritual breakthrough, and how we can break through those. But our primary image, metaphor, for the way that we prepare was the farmer and the growing seed, the parable that Jesus told. About the farmer who goes out and he prepares the soil and he plants the seed, and then he just goes home and goes to sleep. And when he wakes up the next morning, he sees that the the blade has come through, the head has come through, and eventually the harvest is ready. The idea being that These most miraculous things are not under our control. It's nothing that we can do. It's nothing that we can force. It's nothing that we can make happen. But there is lots of work to do to create the ideal conditions for that to happen. That's the key. If you look at the farmer, he's always working. But he knows that the outcome is not under his control. That happens while he's sleeping. Jesus says, look at the birds, you know, they don't worry, they don't toil, they don't stir up in storehouses, you know, but their father, the Father feeds them. But take a look at a bird. Birds are always working, always looking for food, always building the nest. And then when you knock down the nest, they rebuild the nest, right? They just start all over again. It's that kind of paradox, living with that kind of paradox of both hard work, striving for an outcome, but not holding on to the outcome, and with a highly conscious waiting, allowing the outcome to manifest. It, it is the most difficult thing for us to do, most difficult thing for us to separate, because it seems like we just want to flop down on one side or another. But this is what we're trying to do. In our preparation for Pentecost, can we create the ideal conditions interiorly for this breakthrough to happen? Can we absolutely do that? Yes, we can. But the modern Western world is so different from the ancient world that we're going to have to put on a different pair of glasses. Does Scripture tell us how to prepare? Yes. But the way that it tells us is not going to be immediately apparent if we can't step into the sandals of the people who were first hearing these words. 
And this is what we need to do. If we can put ourselves back in that world, then we can start to catch a glimpse of what Jesus means when he's talking. And especially what he says at John 3, 8. What does he say at John 3? He's talking to Nicodemus here, right? Nicodemus is not getting what he's talking about being born in spirit. And he says, the wind blows where it pleases. You hear the sound of it, but you can't tell where it's coming from or where it's going to. And so it is with people who are born of the Spirit. The wind. You can't see it. You hear it. You see the effects of it. But you have no idea. And you certainly can't control it. He's showing us something really important here. He's showing us a completely different way of approaching life. A completely different way of approaching Spirit than we do through religion than we do through theology, than we do in acquiring anything else that we acquire in life. There's a different approach here, and he's trying to get at that in the only way that he can, which is through metaphor. It's through evocative words that hopefully will engage us in a journey that will take us where we absolutely need to go. So we understand the meaning of Jesus' words in something like this phrase here, this passage. But where it's pointing to as an actual experience of life and spirit is something quite different. Trying to put ourselves in that ancient world. Try to imagine for just a second, and you can close your eyes and do this. Imagine living in a world where you don't understand the workings of nature. You don't know what thunder is. You don't know what lightning is. Earthquakes, eclipses, all the natural workings are like magic to you. You don't understand them. You see God in them. You see wonderful things in them the way a child would see because we don't understand the workings. Our minds haven't so grasped something, put edges around it, put a pin through it and stuck it under glass that we're still living the wonder of the nature that's around us. Imagine living where there are impossibly dark nights. There is no light pollution. There's no street lights. It's immobilizing. You have to stop. It's so dark at night, except for the starlight and the moon. And the stars are like an explosion across the sky. The Milky Way belt is visible everywhere. You see these stars every single night. You wonder at them. You imagine God putting them into the firmament of the heavens. And you live at a very different pitch, very different level. There's the fire that you light at night, that you gather around. Your only entertainment are the stories and the chants and the music and the dancing that you create yourself. It's also your school for learning what your forefathers were taught, what your fathers were taught, what you will teach your children. Everything focuses around that circle of light in this vast darkness. Imagine never seeing a reflection of your own face. Have you ever even thought about that? There were mirrors back in the ancient world. Yeah, you could catch your face in a reflection in a pool of water, but it was ripply and it's only transitory. Your main identification was not with yourself. You didn't know what you looked like. I mean, just that is mind blowing if you think about it. You know, it's kind of like Indian poker where you have your last card on your forehead, everybody can see it, but you can't. That's your face. You can't see it. You're identifying more with others. You're identifying more with the community than you do with yourself because you don't know what you look like. Imagine spending an entire week on your wedding. And I don't mean planning it. I mean doing it. Weeks lasted a full, I mean, weddings lasted a full week. It was the center of attention for the entire community. Everybody was there. Time was experienced so differently. To burn a whole week on a wedding was no big deal. In fact, your daily time only resolved plus or minus one hour. We make appointments now down to five minutes, Mark. Yeah, let's meet at 6.05. Well, how about if, like, we meet somewhere between 9 and 10? Is that okay with you? And if it's at night, then it's just by the watches, which are three hours long. That's the resolution of your time. Imagine time being so loose that plus or minus an hour is no big deal. Life lived that slowly. 
Life lived, life lived on a completely different pitch. Imagine being in a caravan on an ocean of sand where you could see nothing except sand all around you. Imagine what those nights look like when you pitch the tent and you look up. It would be like being on a small koa canoe, the Polynesians, setting out on blue water with nothing for thousands of miles around them and not even knowing that there was nothing for thousands of miles around them because they're just heading off to see what's there. This kind of world is something that is so foreign to us. We can't really get our heads around. What kind of life would there be if you lived in a world like this? Well, it would be a lot slower. It would be much earthier. You would be connected to the ground. Your feet would be in the soil. It would be magical. There would still be magic around. God would be around. You would see God in the world around you. How would you relate to others in a world like this? How would you relate to nature, to God, to spirit? It would be much more real. It would be part, spirit would be part of everyday life. You would see it in the rhythms of nature. You would see it in the rise and the fall of the seasons and the rains and the crops. Everything had a rhythm to it. Life would be lived so more connected. It would be visceral. The ancient Hebrews had a world that was much more like the indigenous cultures that we have now or that we can still remember and have some historical insight into. And they realized a different kind of spirituality. Native Americans, Pacific Islanders, Polynesians, Asians, different type of spirituality because their indigenous lifestyles are so much more like this ancient spirituality. And specifically Hawaiian spirituality has amazing parallels with ancient Hebrew. And even, by extension, ancient Christian tradition and culture as well. The apple didn't far that fall that far from the tree originally in the earliest followers of Jesus. It has drifted, of course, since. But back then, we can draw parallels with Hawaiian spirituality to Hebrew spirituality and Christian tradition. And in those traditions, breath was of central importance in these ancient cultures. We've said this before dozens of times, but the word for spirit in Hebrew is ruach. In Aramaic, it's ruha. Listen to the sound of those words. They don't come from nowhere. It's the sound of breath. Because that word means, those words mean both spirit, breath, and wind all at the same time. They saw that as one thing. The rising and falling of breath, the constant movement. Breath and wind are defined by motion. Spirit is defined by motion in that mindset. Ruach, ruha. In Hawaiian, the word is ha, breath, right? Ha means both breath, wind, and spirit, exactly the same, all at the same time. The breath of life, the breath of the trade winds that gave their islands life, the breath of God. And their word alo meant in the presence of. So aloha literally means in the presence of breath. The traditional Hawaiian greeting back in the ancients was to touch noses, to come nose to nose, and literally share each other's breath. That was the greeting. Breath. Breath. We can't understand Hebrew or Hawaiian spirituality without understanding breath, without understanding wind. It is so connected to the idea of spirit. And if we don't understand Hebrew spirituality, then how in the world are we going to understand Jesus' words when he uses wind the way he does to try to describe what this breakthrough, what this Pentecost is going to look like? So comparing Hawaiian spiritual principles to Hebrew and Christian traditions can give us a glimpse into five ways of daily living, of daily life that can help us to learn to see the wind, to see the spirit around us. And I want to just take the rest of this time and go through some readings 
and connect them and see if we can connect the dots of these five. And look at Hawaiian spirituality. It changes things. How many of you have been to Hawaii? Most of you? Okay. And I'm not just talking Waikiki and Honolulu, you know, the parts that have now been completely westernized. You know, if you've been out to Kauai, if you've been out to, to uh, Maui, and especially the windward side, Marion and I, our last major vacation, starting to be a while, honey, we went to the Big Island, and we spent time on the Kona Coast. And I think the, sing the memory that is the most singular to me is we went down to South Point, and I don't know if you know South Point. It's kind of a triangular-shaped island in the bottom point. It's the lowest point in the United States. But when you're standing at South Point and you're looking out of the, over the Pacific, you have this in the back of your mind that there is nothing there for over 2,500 miles. We don't realize that Hawaii is one of the most isolated places on the face of the earth. There's nothing around it for at least 2,000 miles in any direction. Nothing. The Polynesians who discovered it had to travel in small canoes over 2,500 miles. How did they hit it? <laughs> How do you hit this needle in this ocean? But they did. And it's just mind-bending. But to stand on that cliff face with this breeze that never stopped in your face, that bent the trees over almost perpendicular in every direction, and to look out over that just vast sea. It was a different kind of moment. Time ran differently. Marion and I would have liked to have studied there all day, I think. It was just such an amazing moment. This breath of God is something that we need to take a look at, and maybe the Hawaiians can help us. I'll be reading primarily from an article by Belden Lane, who has done amazing work in uh, what he calls fierce landscapes. But he writes, the wind was still strong as we came down from the crater rim on Haleakala shortly after sunrise. Waiting alongside others in the 4 a.m. darkness, we had watched the sun rise out of the Pacific like an orange-red ember. It was a cold morning. Standing at 10,000 feet, people huddled in blankets against the 15-mile-an-hour winds from the east. The winds in Hawaii almost always come from the east and are strong, steady, insistent like the frequent northeasters of New England and the Sirocco of the Algerians, it seems never to cease. The ancient Hawaiians called it ha, the breath of God. For thousands of years, this wind has formed the physical and spiritual life of the peoples of the Pacific. Its consistent direction allowed early Polynesian explorers to travel thousands of miles over the ocean in simple koa wood canoes. The wind has also brought rain, washing the verdant mountains, forests on the windward side of the islands. In Hebrew mythology, wind herald Lono, the god of storm and rain and hence of fertility. Like Ezekiel and Job, the Pacific peoples have known that God often speaks from the whirlwind. Theirs is a faith shaped by aloha, a word drawn from two roots, meaning in the presence of wind, breath, or spirit. In Hawaii, to speak of God means necessarily to be open to the often disturbing and life-giving wind of the Spirit. And you hear this over and over again, this idea of disturbance. There's always this notion of disturbance. Disturbance always comes into this movement into Spirit. And what's more disturbing than being in a tiny koa wood boat, literally just a dug-out log, two of them strapped together? with all of your belongings in between on netting, sailing into complete unknown, into blue water, and at the mercy of wind and water, the two most powerful forces on earth, wind and water. This graphically depicts each of our journey through life, if you think about it. To sail into the unknown, to not have enough information to make a risk-free decision, and to make the decision anyway, to put one foot in front of the other in that faith walk. Every life is like this, physically and especially spiritually. And scripture reflects this type of journey that we're on. We want to imagine that scripture gives us definite answers, calling it the rule book or the owner's manual. But that's not scripture's intent. That's not the way it was written. It was written to show us the shape of the journey and how we needed to move forward. Take a look at what Thomas Merton writes about the Bible. 
It is one. It is of the very nature of the Bible to affront, perplex, and astonish the human mind. Anyone ever been affronted, perplexed, and astonished by reading the Bible? Hence, the reader who opens the Bible must be prepared for disorientation, confusion, incomprehension, and perhaps outrage. We could have added disturbance, right? The Bible is without question one of the most unsatisfying books ever written, at least until the reader has come to terms with it in a very special way. But it is a difficult book to come to terms with, far easier, perhaps, if one just pretends the question is all settled in advance. The Bible raises the question of identity in a way no other book does. When you begin to question the Bible, you find that the Bible is also questioning you. When you ask, what is this book, you find that you are also implicitly being asked, who is this that reads it? One does not go from answer to answer, but from question to question. One's questions are answered not by clear, definitive answers, but by more pertinent and more crucial questions. We are to understand life not by analyzing it, but by living it in such a way that we come to a full realization of our own identity. The experience of spirit is like this. It's being willing to be disturbed. It's like setting off into an ocean of water or an ocean of sand, for that matter. 14th century anonymous Christian in England writes in Middle English of the cloud of unknowing that you may have heard of. But listen to what he says here, right along these lines. Thought cannot comprehend God. And so I prefer to abandon all I can know, choosing rather to love him whom I cannot know. Though we cannot know him, we can love him. By love, he may be touched and embraced, but never by thought. In the beginning of our journeys, it's usual to feel nothing but a kind of darkness about your mind, or as it were, a cloud of unknowing. You will seem to know nothing and to feel nothing except a naked intent toward God in the depths of your being. You will feel frustrated, for your mind will be unable to grasp him and your heart will not relish the delight of his love. But learn to be at home in this darkness. Return to it as often as you can, letting your spirit cry out to him whom you love. For if, in this life, you hope to feel and see God as he is in himself, it must be within this darkness, within this cloud. He's telling us to rest in the unknowing, to begin to enjoy the unknowing that often scares us so much. To begin to see life as an adventure. Can we do that? Uncontrolled? Let it be uncontrolled? You know, the adventure begins where your car breaks down, right? You know that, of course. Everything that you plan, if it goes right, okay, great. It was smooth, it was wonderful, and you forgot about it in a few weeks. Let your car break down. Now you've got an adventure you'll be talking about to your kids are just sick of hearing it, right? I remember uh, doing a wedding just over here, probably getting to be 10 years ago. And uh, the wedding was going fine. Everything was going according to plan. And if it had stayed that way, I wouldn't be talking about it right now. and probably would have forgot all about it. But there was a little, the little ring bearer. Her name, I still remember her name was Madeline. Cutest little thing, dark hair and the fluffy white dress, and she gives the rings, and we're right at that most sensitive portion in the middle of the ceremony, right? The ring exchange, repeat after me, and all of a sudden, in the loudest voice that you can imagine, you hear little Madeline, I want a ring too. <laughs> it took a long time for us to recover enough to continue the, <laughs> the ceremony. You could say that the, the uh, ceremony was spoiled. You could say that that moment was ruined. But it was the adventure. It was the unexpected. It was the surprise that turned it into something completely different. And it was so wonderful. Can we learn to live like that? Can we learn to appreciate those moments? Can we learn to live in aloha? Allow the billowing and the wind to just take us where it takes us. Now, if we can't do that, there's a name for us, and the Hawaiians have that too. In Hawaii, I received a new name, one that defined me in ways I did not want to accept. I came to be known as a Haole. <laughs> have you heard that before? 
It's a term that Hawaiians have applied to white-skinned foreigners since the arrival of the British sea captain James Cook in 1778. At first, they welcomed Cook as a god and believed his ships came to the islands on the winds of Lono. But his incessant and arrogant demands for provisions soon made him appear considerably less than divine. His men took the women they wanted and shot anyone who got in their way. The word howly, perhaps not inappropriately, means without breath. Howly, without breath, without wind, without spirit. A colorless, pate-weist absence of spirit and feeling. An inability to appreciate the land and the dignity of its people. Yet to be able to recognize oneself as howly is also to be open to repentance and subsequently to a new wholeness. To accept a new name is also to entertain a new way of being. The Spirit of God broods over the waters of east and west, both, breathing new life in both directions, known in Hebrew as Ruach, in Greek as Numa, in Latin as Anima, in Sanskrit and Chinese as Prima and Chi, or in Polynesian as Mana, The sacred wind of God's breath cannot be limited to the categories of thought most familiar to Western theology. How does one summarize for Western Christians how the breath of God moves over the waters and speaks with critical insight to the breathless character of Western religious experience? Its tendency toward individualism and compulsive action to its overly spiritual rejection of the natural world and its general posture of dominance and conquest. Western life is howly, keeping both breath and earth at arm's length, always, imagining that somehow we are above or beyond or outside of the control of the forces of wind and weather. Jesus' way, spiritual breakthrough, this Pentecost that we're chasing, is bringing breath back into our lives, ironically moving into a kind of breathlessness, with that excitement and that anticipation of something just around the corner. It's a sense of setting out on blue water in a tiny canoe with no guarantee of outcome, just the experience of going, of being on the water. There are five interconnected elements of Hawaiian spirituality that I think can help us to bring back, us back, to Jesus' life and teaching and point us toward Pentecost. And you could follow along in the handouts because it might help to see some of these in print as I go through them. Because this first element is manawa in Hawaiian, means the slowing of time. Traditional Hawaiian attitudes toward time and work are very different from the hurried drivenness of most Westerners who seldom have the time to catch their breath. Time for many of us is a series of short-winded fleeting intervals crying out to be filled. But Manawa signifies instead the lingering, gentle ebb of water across a tranquil bay. And in this way of thinking, time isn't so much something to be used as it is a place in which one tarries with a three-mile-an-hour God. Three-mile-an-hour, that's a walking pace, and a leisurely walking pace. A three-mile-an-hour God, alongside of whom one walks without hurry, the patient rhythmic breathing of one step following another, Reminds us of Genesis, Adam and Eve walking with God in the cool of the evening. An image of this pace, this slowness, this unhurried presence. In Polynesian mythology, no hero is more famous than Maui, the mischievous trickster. In one tale, Maui captures the sun with ropes early one morning as the brilliant orb rises over the crater of Haleakala. After lassoing each ray of the rising sun, he tied them to a willy-willy tree making the sun promise to slow down in its passage across the sky. This would give his mother time to finish without haste her daily chores of drying tapa cloth and preparing food. As a result, Hawaiians have always been invited to share in the slowing down of time. Time is a function of spirit and breath, something far different from the digital inflexibility many Westerners have made of it. There's a great story in the the, uh, Odyssey, Homer's masterpiece, where when Odysseus finally gets back to Ithaca, his home island, his first night with his wife Penelope after 20 years, the gods slow down the sun from rising the next day so they can have all the time they need on their first night together. I just, what a wonderful image. Like Maui holding back the sun 
It's that primal need for all of us to slow time down. We'd want to do it at times that are so good, but how about if we could practice that throughout? This is the first principle, mindfulness. And I know you've heard that before, but understood mindfulness as the awareness of our presence in the moment, awareness of our presence in this moment. Have you noticed and experienced a slowing of time in sports, in music, in art? I'm sure you have. Every one of us has. That time when time almost stands still with the full focus that you've got on it, it slows down. Do you remember as a kid, summers seemed to last forever? Ah, how fast do summers go now? You could lay on the grass and just watch clouds for untold hours, and it felt like one moment. And then you realize, go out and play until the street lights came on. How about that? Do our kids ever experience that anymore? And those afternoons seem to last forever. It's all happening right now. I almost said it's all happening at the zoo, but that would be a different story. It's all happening right now. There's no other moment but right now. And when we have these moments where we're really present, we experience all of time right now in this fully present moment. Look how the cloud of knowing, unknowing puts it. Again, I'll go back. God, the master of time, never gives the future. He gives only the present, moment by moment. For this is the law of the created order, and God will not contradict himself in his creation. Time is for man and not man for time. God, the Lord of nature, will never anticipate man's choices, which follow one after another in time. Man will not be able to excuse himself at the last judgment, saying to God, you overwhelmed me with the future when I was only capable of living in the present. That's not going to work. You know, when you think about it, it's only our minds that overwhelm us with the future, not life. Our minds overwhelm us with the past and with all this abstract thought and everything that is left undone, and it keeps us away and makes time speed through rather than being able to be held back. Jesus at Matthew 6, verse 28, And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They don't toil, they don't spin, yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you? Oh, you of little faith, do not worry then saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles equally eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows what you need and knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will take care of itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Truer words were never spoke. Jesus is trying to discern for us the difference between the urgent and the important. We think something is important because it's urgent, and we never get to the important things. Important things often stand outside time. Jesus is trying to sensitize that to us. He's setting the priorities and teaching us to take our time, to be mindful of our presence in the moment. A second feature is aloha aina, the love of the land in Hawaiian. Hawaiians deeply appreciate place and seldom generalize God's presence in an abstract way, but find it in specific places, here in the circle of stones beside the pandanus tree, there in the thick bamboo forest on the tra trail to Waimea Falls. The insistence of life is most telling on the windward side of the islands. There everything bends to extravagance, Flame red torch ginger and plumeria bloom and grow wild and profuse on the road to Hana. Yet everything dies in equal exuberance. The flora molds and rots, ever making room for new. The wooden porch from which one surveys the sea is slowly carried away by tiny ants working everywhere underfoot. Green moss waits nearby to reclaim what had once been separated from the earth. Aina describes all of this the land is literally that which feeds, nourishing the spirit in its prodigal display of bounteousness. And this leads us to a second principle, prayerfulness. 
but prayerfulness understood as the awareness of God's presence anchored in this moment, anchored in this place. Mindfulness is awareness of our presence. Prayerfulness is awareness of God's presence anchored in this moment. And the prayer is not about words. It's about this presence. The prayer can have no words, but if it does have words, the words are meant to focus us back on the present, back on God's presence. Never abstract. Prayer that grounds us in specific environment brings us back to this moment, to this reality of place, to this presence of spirit. For the Hebrews, it was Shekinah. Have you heard that word before? Sometimes pronounced Shekinah. Shekinah. They understood it as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. It would settle on the tent of meeting. It would settle on the temple. And God's presence was visible, visceral, real. It was something that was there. It was as real as the land on which it settled. It was as real as this place where they were at. We're a part of it, and it is a part of us. We're not above. We're not outside. Our prayerfulness to bring us into that kind of contact with God's presence is what we're talking about here. 19th century Russian author wrote The Way of the Pilgrim. He puts it this way. Remember God always, everywhere and in all situations. When you behold light, remember who gives it to you. When you see heaven and earth and sea and all that they contain, be in awe and give praise to their creator. When you put on your clothes, remember whose gift they are and give thanks to him who takes care of your needs. These people saw God as concrete, in the breath, in the place, in the moment, in the space. The Hebrews had the name for human beings as nefesh haya, nefesh haya, Genesis 2-7, nefesh haya. It's a living being. It's a being of breath. We were understood to be animated by God's breath. It's God's breath that flows through us, that animates us, that makes us alive and able to move and think and love and do the things we do. God breathed into our nostrils to bring us through this life. Nefesh haya. And then Paul says, all scripture is God breathed. Theonustos in Greek, but God breathed infused in the physical, real life around us. How does Jesus see it? Look at Matthew 25, starting at verse 32. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them from one another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. And then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Truly, I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. We hear this passage, and we immediately are thinking only of the judgment at the last moment, right? But listen to where the focus really is. Relationship with God, Jesus is saying. The reality of God's presence, Jesus is saying, is experienced in everyday relationship, everyday interaction. Nowhere else, really. If we can't experience God in each other, in our relationship with each other, in our willingness to be there for each other, we won't experience God at all. John says, anyone who says he loves God and Hates his brother is a liar. It's this equivalent that we love God by loving each other. It's concrete. It's real. The presence is here and now. And our prayer gives wings to that. Our prayer empowers us in that. And especially in this third aspect, the position of Pacific Asian spirituality. This one is called mo'olelo, the power of the spoken word. In Hawaii, theology is always to be chanted or sung. We've made a, I've made a big deal about the song lines of the Aborigines in Australia. It's exactly the same type of culture. They had a portable spirituality. They didn't write things down. They didn't build temples. They didn't build cities. They didn't farm. They were always on the move. They were nomads. Their spirituality had to be portable, something they could carry along. 
They would memorize it, as starting as children around those campfires, chanting and singing the wisdom of their culture until everybody knew it and could sing it. The theology is to be chanted or sung. Sacred chants were traditionally practiced on the beach so as to reproduce the modulations of wind and waves. There's a picture for you around your campfire on the beach under an explosion of stars at night, chanting and singing. To do theology the Pacific Asian way is to connect one's innermost being to the presence of God in the surrounding environment by means of breath. It's an inescapably physical, sacramental experience. This contrasts with Western theology's bias toward the written expression of abstract thought. Sacred tales must be spoken. There is power in their words, a force coming from the sound breathed into them. Traditional Hawaiians emphasize this oral power in storytellers, those skilled in the art of apo, catching the spoken word, so as to allow the event to be re-experienced. This ancient tradition is reflected in the contemporary Pacific Asia practice of talk story. Unlike Western narratives that strive for a balanced formal structure, talk story is a rambling way of remembering the past so as to create it anew in the changing moment. In the past century, plantation workers would gather to talk in the evenings near the pineapple fields. One of them might ask in pidgin English, remember when we was small kid time? <laughs> Don't you love that? Remember when we was small kid time? And the fragmented tales of the past would be spun out in the shape of fantasy, lending a dignity to the hardships of the present. A mother would often talk story to her daughter at night as she went to sleep, making it impossible to know where the stories left off and the dreams began. It is the nature of talk story to be open-ended, given to dreamlike images, intimately available to the spirit. The Aborigines call this dream time, all at once time, everywhere and every when, all together at one moment. And they understand that dream time is the actual physical reality of this universe. Our experience of it linearly is the illusion. Beautiful. Here's the blending of word and action, bringing it into one thing. And here's our third principle, prayerful action to be aware of the connection between our prayers and reality, to live our faith. Our prayer is the empowerment to act, infusing prayer life into the physical world. No separation. Prayer, life, action, connection, community, movement. We're moving right into the Brother Lawrence School, right? Everything is happening right here in the kitchen. I don't need to go here. I don't need to go there. I don't need to create all these means that coming to God. Just do what I normally do all day long and infuse it with this prayer that is my action. In Genesis 1-3, God says, let there be light, and there was light. His words carried on breath bring a reality, absolute reality. To the Hebrews, words were sacred. They were sacred action. They were carried on breath. Our words carried import as well. God's word carried creation. John 20, 22, and when Jesus had said this to his disciples, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. He breathed on them, making that connection between words and breath, prayer and action. Our action is the fulfillment of our prayer not getting an answer in the way that we want an answer, but getting the empowerment to act and experience truth. The fourth factor is ohana. And any of you who have seen Disney movies probably know ohana, right? It's the importance of family and the importance of community. The universe is seen as an immense family tree. All things in it are related. Ohana describes the family connectedness valued so highly in Hawaiian experience. Derived from the word oha, referring to the tiny interconnecting roots of the taro plant, it is an appropriate image for the closely knit community where relationships serve as an anchor of identity. In Hawaii, I had experienced hospitality and graciousness like nowhere else. The traditional Hawaiian family carefully preserved its own proverbs and chants, 
its occasions for house blessings and the naming of children, its rites of inhaling the first light of day and the conferring of creative powers by exhaling. As in similar Native American traditions, all of these symbolic images and gestures are associated with the wind and with the breathing of the universe, the visible motion of the power that invests everything in existence. To exist in family is to experience an insistent Chinook wind blowing warm in winter and cool in summer, leading a direction and center, lending a direction and center to all that one does. In Hebrew, the world is mishpacha, mishpacha, extended family. In Hebrew and in Aramaic, there is no word for cousin. Everyone is brothers and sisters. The nuclear family just has bendable edges, and it includes everything, includes all to the extent of the tribe, to the nation of Israel. Ancient and indigenous cultures are pointing in the same direction. And this is our fourth concept, connectedness. The awareness of identification with others and God in the moment. Identification with others over ourselves in that sense that we haven't seen our own reflection. We know what you look like, but I don't know what I look like. That kind of connection that sees all as family. At Luke 10, verse 29, who is my neighbor, Jesus is asked by the lawyer. And he responds with the story of the Good Samaritan. And you know the story. There's a man, a Jew, who was taken by robbers and left in the gutter by the side of the street, bleeding, robbed. Two Jewish priests go by and do nothing. The third man who comes by is a Samaritan, hated by the Jews, who takes him and cares for him. And the message that Jesus is giving is that he's extending mishpacha, ohana, beyond blood, beyond culture, beyond the confines of our nation or national boundaries to the entire human family. Looking at people, all people, as one organism with many moving parts, all breathing as one, breathing each other's breath, if you will, nose to nose, God's breath at the same time. It's kind of like mouth to mouth resuscitation. You know, taking what oxygen we can amid the CO2 from each other, breathing the same breath, which we do anyway, but being conscious of it, conscious of the interconnection. And finally, Hawaiian spirituality includes eha eha, the cry for justice. This emerges out of the dislocation and pain that many along the Pacific Rim have suffered. In the theology of the pain of God, Kazu Kitamori suggests that in the heart of the gospel is found in God's own excruciating. Let me say that again. He suggests that the heart of the gospel is found in God's own excruciating pain, witnessed most powerfully in the cross of Jesus Christ. This pain grew out of God's deepest longing for justice and love. The Hawaiian word for such agony is eha eha referring to the physical effort of hard breathing. Eha, eha, hard breathing, or panting. This is a heart-rending, lung-bursting experience of brokenness, like a woman's experience of childbirth. But out of it comes a divine cry for justice that refuses to be silenced. Rabbi Arthur Wasco tells a rabbinic story about the disclosure of God's name to Moses at the time of the Exodus. As an afterthought, having revealed, revealed the holy name of Yahweh, God also gives Moses a nickname to use with those people who may not recognize Hebrew. What is the name of God that everyone will know? Yah. Yah, the sound of breathing. Moses is told, that is enough. That name will be spoken in the slave huts of Egypt and uttered in, the, in pain by the oppressed. To that call, God responds with hope and deliverance from bondage. Crying out in the hard breath, crying out as we do from the traumas of life that we've all experienced, is also at the same time birthing the next truth that you will experience in your life if we are aware enough to see and accept that truth, to see that pain, that hard breathing as the purpose and the driving force behind. And that's our fifth and final spiritual element, brokenness. The awareness of meaning in pain and suffering. 
James 1, verse 2 to 4. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Pain is the part of life that works to complete us in love, in justice, in mercy. It creates the cry. It creates the hard breathing that sensitizes us to the pain of others, drives us to care for others, to champion them, to overcome the inertia and the complacency that keeps us in place, to lay down our lives for a friend, as Jesus said, was the greatest form of love. These themes speak to Western theology with a deep prophetic simplicity. They invite us to the humble posture of the Malahini, Malahini, the beginner, who always perceives the truth as a surprise. <laughs> I love that. Here it is that a Howley like myself must always begin if he or she is to be surprised by grace. And we've talked so often about the Anavim in Hebrew culture. Same idea. Completely dependent on God. Grateful even in the difficulties, even in the hard breathing, the eha eha, that same spirit is there in Anavim. I'm told that the Maoris of New Zealand sing a hymn known as Ha Ha as they invoke the divine breath or wind on those being initiated into tribal mysteries. It is a holy laughter that falls like a spring breeze on people made newly open to the truth. Given the enormous unpredictability of grace, it seems also to be a gift made available even to Howleys. Reflecting on theology in a Pacific Asian context requires learning a new story, chanting to the universe, imitating the winds. It comes to us, finally, as a freeing movement of God's spirit across deep blue sea waters. These five elements can prepare us. These five elements can help us to create an ideal condition inside ourselves for the moment of Pentecost for us, for a gradual Pentecost for us. Mindfulness, aware of our presence in the moment. Prayerfulness, aware of God's presence in this place, in this moment, but also in the land, in the environment, in the circumstances. Prayerful action, understood as fulfilling the prayer, not looking for intellectual answers, but seeing the answer in the action that is initiated and empowered by the prayer. Connectedness with others over ourselves, feeling more connection for other than for self so that everything starts to right size. And of course, brokenness, seeing the meaning in pain, birthing the next new truth in our lives. Malahini, Anavim character is made up of all of this. If we can start practicing these in any way in our lives, be aware and conscious of the choices that we make so we can go here, we can begin developing these traits in ourselves, which creates the ideal conditions for Pentecost in our own upper room, in our own gospel. To live life as a beginner, willing to unlearn, willing to learn, willing to be surprised, willing to be humble enough to be surprised and admit that you're surprised, willing to be blown about on a tiny koa canoe on a vast blue sea. We can't make it happen. But these are the ideal conditions for learning to begin to see the wind. And even though Jesus said you can't see the wind, he's teaching us how to see the wind as it presents in our lives, as spirit, as breath. It's God's presence. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for every culture that can point us to you, that can illuminate our tradition, can illuminate our culture, help us to reinfuse everything we think we know. Father, we want the Pentecost moment in our lives. We want to break through to a deeper understanding of how we connect, to have the empowerment that allows us to live bigger with you and with each other. Help us to find within ourselves the desire to implement and to start making choices that look like this 
so that we can find you more deeply in every moment. Thank you for your love and your constancy for never leaving or forsaking us, Lord. Never let us forget. We can only love because you loved us first. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand.